Chapter 16, 13 to 19. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Theatara, Theatera, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing to, for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Camilla. I appreciate that. And if you have not already done so, I want to encourage you to take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. We're going to pick up in our study as we've been taking a look at the church in Antioch. And as we do, I want to encourage us specifically this morning to just pause and see ourselves in this story. And I know that that's kind of hard to do. I mean, it's like, okay, well, Bill, we don't live in ancient Antioch. I mean, how in the world are we supposed to see ourselves in the story? Well, first, what I want you to see is is that as Paul and Silas make their way from Antioch to the city of Philippi, what you probably are going to miss is that Philippi was, in many ways, Bucharest for Macedonia at that time. It was the seat of government. It was a big city. It was a combination of many cultures. 
And as a result, their experience would have been very similar to our experience here in Bucharest, Romania in 2024. Now, as we get into this this morning, it's probably not going to tell us a lot about how to live more of a moral life. Probably not going to tell you much about spiritual gifts. Maybe not how to relate to one another in the home, but I will tell you, it's going to tell you an awful lot about how we should be relating to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And my hope is, is that as we go forth from this place this morning, we will find hope for the days in which we live. Days that can be challenging. Days in which we need each other more than ever before. So with that in mind, I want to ask you to join me as we go to the Father and ask him to bless our time in his word. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to take your word now and to use it to communicate to our hearts truth. And Lord, as you do this morning, I pray that it would also bring encouragement to those who find themselves in the midst of a circumstance that maybe is a little too heavy. I pray that, Lord, it would encourage each in this room with the knowledge of knowing that they are not alone, that not only are you with them in the midst of their current crisis, but that you've also given us one another as brothers and sisters in Christ to walk through the crisis with them. Lord, I pray this morning that you'd bring encouragement to those who are discouraged, hope to the hopeless, strength to the weak, that your will will be done in this room and that each of us would say with a resounding voice, once we hear your will communicated, may your will be done. Lord, I ask you to make these words clear that you might speak and that we would have ears to hear. And I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the city can be, Bucharest, Romania, the city, it can be an exciting place. It's full of culture. You go and you find the museums and the different things that you enjoy that teach you a little bit about what Romania is. You find here in the bigger city things of fashion, and you find the arts. Some of us enjoy going to the, the symphony or, or, or going to the opera. There's, you can find all sorts of types of entertainment here. There's a lot of things that make your life richer in the city. But I can also suggest that for some, the city can also be actually a very scary place. It's a place where you find multiple different cultures, different nationalities, different values. People who look at life differently than you and I, who approach life in a different way. They live different lifestyles than we know. As a result of that, we have to ask ourselves, how should we be responding then when we come in contact with those that are different than us? Should we cower and hide? Should we withdraw? Should we pull back simply because they are different? Or maybe should we have a different response? Well, as we take a look this morning, we're going to see Paul and Silas arrive in this unique city that was the seat of government in Macedonia. It was the city of culture in that part of the world. And as they get there, I believe we're going to learn some lessons that will help us answer those questions. Paul and Silas, as we get back into the story, they are traveling together simply because Paul and Barnabas had had a falling out. <laughs> they had had a strong disagreement over Barnabas's nephew, John Mark, or his cousin, John Mark. And as a result, they went in two different directions. They continued on in the ministry, but they went in two different directions Barnabas went with John Mark, and Paul took Silas. Silas, you might recall, was one of the two that had come from Jerusalem to deliver the letter that had come from the council at the church in Jerusalem to answer the question that had been asked by the church in Antioch concerning circumcision. And Paul, having gotten to know Silas, must have determined that Silas was a good man that he wanted to travel with, so he invites him to come along for the journey. So they leave from Antioch, and they start to make their way across where they will ultimately end up in Philippi. 
I want to show you a little bit of the journey that they made so that you can just get a little bit of a sense of what they actually did. As you see on the screen in front of you, you can see as you look all the way over on the right side of the screen, there's a big red dot there next to Antioch, and it's underlined. That's where they began this journey. And as they start to make their way along the journey, as you follow that purple line, they immediately come to the town of Tarshish, as you see. Most scholars believe that would have been Paul's hometown. There's no reason why he wouldn't have stopped there, probably to visit family, to visit those that he knew. But then they go on from there to the places where they had originally done ministry on their first journey. They originally go to the towns of, uh, of, of Perga. They go to Iconia. They, they, they go on even to Antioch in that region. They make their way through a lot of the places that they had visited before so that they can eventually arrive over in the port city of Troas. And you're going to see this as we get started in the text. So I want to encourage you, if you will, to join me by going, from, or going to Acts chapter 16. And we're going to start in verse 11. In verse 11, it says, So setting sail from Troas, which is where they had arrived, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace. And you see that on the screen. That is an island there in the green box as they are making their way. And the following day, they catch another boat on to Neapolis, which was the port city there in Macedonia where they had arrived. And from there, they went just a few miles north to the main city of Philippi which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we remained in the city for some days. They went there because they knew that this would have been the place where they could have had the most influence in the region of Macedonia. They also went there, if you go back in the text, if you go back a few verses earlier, you'll learn, because Paul had received a vision where in the vision he was called to come to Macedonia. And he followed in obedience. Upon arriving there, they find a city that is very similar to the city that we currently live in. From their experiences while they are there, I believe that we can learn some things that will help us, that will help us right here in modern-day Bucharest, because Bucharest is a lot like Philippi. So with that in mind, I want us to answer just a simple question initially, and we're going to make our way through what actually happened to these men but then I believe we're going to learn a lesson that will help us. So I hope that you'll stick with me as we make our way through this. The question I want to ask is simply, what happened after Paul and Silas came to the key city of Philippi? Now, that's pretty obvious, but <clears throat> the three things that actually take place are maybe not quite so obvious. And I want to point those out as we make our way through it, leading to some lessons that I truly believe will be beneficial for us today. First, the first thing that happened to them as we continue along in the text, you will see, is that their consistency was used to open hearts. And you'll see that as you join me now as we take a look in the text at verses 13 and 14. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place for prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women who had come together one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Theatira, a seller of purple goods who worshipped God. You know, it's really interesting to me that as Paul and Barnabas traveled, they did this. And now as Paul and Silas traveled, they're doing exactly the same. Every Sabbath day, they were exactly where they were supposed to be. They were consistent about it. It was their custom. They would go seeking out a place of worship, not only for their own personal time of prayer and Bible study, but also so that they could minister to others themselves. There was no doubt where they would be, because on the Sabbath, that was what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to go to worship, which makes me wonder when we are traveling. I know I was just speaking to some a little bit ago about their vacation. And while we are traveling, when we are abroad, and some of you are getting ready to do that, when we are traveling, where does worship rate on your priority list? Are you seeking out a place to gather with other brothers and sisters in Christ so that you can continue to be fed, so that you can continue to seek out others in prayer, so that you can grow closer to God? God uses our consistency when we do. 
Friends, for those of us who have children, can I suggest he will use that consistency in your home. It will tell your children what's important to you. When Paul and, Paul and Silas traveled, it showed what was important to them. So they look for a place of worship. They go outside the city supposing that they're going to find it along the river, and instead what they actually find is a women's Bible study. <laughs> and as a result, they gather with them. They figure, well, if there's no other place out here for us to worship, we'll come and join them. And as they do, they meet this woman by the name of Lydia. And it says that she is a seller of purple goods. Now, this is a very interesting statement, and you probably don't fully understand or fully see all that's involved in that, but this is something that was rare. This was unique. It would have made Lydia probably quite a wealthy woman. You see, at that time, royal royalty were typically the only ones that had things that were made or, or, or looked purple. The reason was simple because in order to be able to dye things in the, in the purple dye, they literally had to go into the sea and they found a special, what was called a, sneeze, a sea snail. And from that sea snail, there was actually a dye that it would produce that would allow for fabric to be dyed in the purple color. And it took a lot of work to be able to find those snails to do that. So as a result, she was able to charge quite a high price for it that probably only the rich and the famous could actually afford, and this made her quite a good living. She wasn't from Philippi. She was from another city, but she'd come to Philippi because it was the place of culture, the place of fashion, the, the, the seat of government, the place of influence. And so she had come there to do her business, and as she came there, she didn't realize that God was going to do something extraordinary in her life. Paul finds her, and he sees that she is a worshiper of God. But if you go to the second half of verse 14, you see that the Lord now, he, God, opens her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. You know, it's really important for us to notice that as we share our faith, as we go around and we tell people about how Christ has changed our life, can I encourage you? Many will do so, and they will get discouraged because people don't believe immediately and follow Christ. Friends, there is no place in Scripture where it teaches us to make converts. That's God's job. Our job is to be faithful with the message. Our job is to go and to tell them that Christ died for sins and that if they will believe in him, he'll give them the gift of eternal life. That is our job. Our job is to be faithful with the message, but it is God who opens hearts. It is God who changes lives. That's why Titus said many years before, or many years later, in Titus 3, 5, that God saved us not because of works that we have done in righteousness. It's God who saves us. He's the one who saved you. He is the one that brought you into relationship with him. He did it according to his mercies by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It was the work of God that placed faith in your heart and changed your life and brought you into relationship with him. It's the very reason why when David had actually fallen into sin with Bathsheba, and you might recall his psalm of repentance, Psalm 51, that he actually says the following as he turns to God. He says in Psalm 51:10, God, you created me a clean heart. God, you renew a right spirit in me. Because he knew he couldn't do it himself. It's only a work that God can do and that was exactly the case here for Lydia. The Lord opened her heart. She believes. We see this in verse 15. After she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. She prevailed upon us. The proof that her transformation was genuine was what happened. She immediately responds with saying, I want the world to know that I am now on God's team, that I am following him. So she immediately goes, as some will do here in the month of August, she goes and, and she gets baptized to let everybody know that she is now following Jesus, and that prompts her family to do the same. And then she even goes a step farther. She said, God has blessed me. He's blessed me beyond what I deserve. I have more than I need I want you to come and to stay with me in my house. And she invites these strangers to stay with her in her home. 
And this all happened because Paul and Silas consistently were where they needed to be on the Sabbath day. They were seeking out a place of worship. Friends, can I ask you, what's your norm? What's your norm on Sunday? Are you regularly seeking to come together with brothers and sisters in Christ because you know that your soul needs it? Because you know that you need to be in the presence of Christ's family so that you can continue to grow in him? Is regular worship part of your consistent norm week to week? Friends, can I suggest your spiritual health truly does depend upon it. Your spiritual health needs regular public worship. Certainly, it's not the only thing. The Bible teaches us that we are to spend time speaking to our Father in prayer, that we are to spend time in study and in meditation and serving our fellow man. But we need each other. We need each other probably more than we've ever needed each other in these days in which we live. Friends, it is nothing less than dangerous to think that you can do the Christian life on your own. It's the reason that the writer of Hebrews encourages us in the following way when he says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, let us consider how to stir one another up towards good works. That's our role, iron sharpening iron, to help and encourage each other to be more like Jesus. But then he continues, he says, don't neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some. Instead, encourage one another and continue to do it more and more because the day of our Savior's return is drawing near. And we need each other as the world gets worse and worse and Jesus' return draws closer. We need each other to continue to make our way through these difficult days in which we live. Paul and Barnabas... When they arrived there in Philippi, God used their consistency. He used it to transform Lydia's life. They were where they were supposed to be. Friends, we need to be where God wants us to be so that he can continue to do work, not only in our lives, but in others' lives as well. But as we continue along, we're going to see that there was something else that happens next. The next thing that happens in the story is, is that urban hostility, the hostility of the city, it tested the ongoing mission that they were there to do. You see, the secular mob, as they saw what was taking place in Paul and Silas's life, they begin to react. They continue their mission initially. As we start up again in verses 16 and 17, we see that. As we are, notice, he's saying, Paul and Silas, they're saying, as we are going to the place of prayer. They're continuing consistently to be doing what they are supposed to be doing. They're, they're going to the place of prayer. And as they do, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination, brought, or, or, or who had a spirit of divination, and, and she brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. Friends, can I suggest to you, they're trying to consistently do what they are called to do. And they come in contact with somebody who is being nothing less than trafficked. She was owned by people, and she was, as a result of what she was doing, she was being used to make money for those who were trafficking her. She was possessed. She was possessed by a... Not, not, nothing less than some sort of evil source that was able to help her to be able to, I guess you could say, tell fortunes, to be able to tell people what their future might hold. She was making a big profit for those who are trafficking her. Paul and Silas, because she's constantly following them around, she's making their life kind of difficult. How is she making her, their life difficult? Look at verse 17. She followed Paul. She followed us. She's crying out. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. You might say, well, how in the world is that making their mission more difficult? I mean, after all, the words that she is saying, they sound pretty good. Well, we don't know. We don't know the tone in which she was saying them. 
Maybe she was saying them in a mocking way where certainly that would have taken away from the words and it would have taken away from the mission. But there was another way that it was really causing a problem for Paul and Silas. You see, as we said a moment ago, she was possessed. And as a result of being possessed and being able to tell other people their fortunes, this was certainly something that Paul and Silas would not have wanted to have been identified with. And yet, with the words that she was saying, some might conclude, you know what? She's just like Paul and Silas. She must be a follower of the one true God. And Paul and Silas knew that that could not be something that could be acceptable. It would not be proper for people to think that that is what Christianity looks like. Therefore, Paul needs to respond to this. He needs to be able to deal with this in a way where others will not get the wrong impression, where they will not conclude that she is a true follower of Christ. Because you see, friends, we live in a day where you can turn on the television or you can go online and you can watch people from all different stripes and all kinds of different backgrounds of faith and they will make proclamations about things that are not in this book. We would actually call them a false teacher. And I want you to listen to what Paul says about false teachers. Listen to how he describes them in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. Now that's what Paul and Silas are concerned about with this young girl. But here's what I want you to see. And he says, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. In other words, the reason why people get drawn in is because when they look at false teachers or they look at this young girl, they see something that they say, well, that doesn't look so bad. That looks pretty good. And as a result, they start to follow them. And before you know it, they are doing things that are not found in this book. Paul and Silas knew that that could never be the case. So Paul responds to her. And we see his response in verses 18 and 19. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, at this point in time, he's become greatly annoyed with it. And he turns and he says to her, he says to the spirit in her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very hour. Her owners saw their hope of profit of being able to continue to profiteer off of this young woman. Their money ticket, so to speak, it's gone. So they seize Paul and Silas, and they drag them to the marketplace before the rulers, before the government officials. They did this simply because they've been exposed. Now everybody can see them for who they truly are. And as a result, not only is their fortune-telling business dead... Not only are they not going to make any more money off of this girl, they realize that others are going to rise up against them. So they do all that they can, as they have been discredited, to try to harm the two who did this to them. It's interesting in the midst of all this, and I want you to notice this, that Paul and Silas, they still, in the midst of all this chaos, were able to achieve mission. What do I mean? This girl had been enslaved. She was owned by these people who wickedly had been trafficking her for their own profit for years. And now they freed her. They freed her from the physical bondage to these men. They freed her from the spiritual bondage to this spirit. But in doing so, the mission that they have been on is going to come to a screeching pause. A pause for a few moments. You see, the Exposed traffickers, they react, and they respond to what has happened. Not only do they draw them before the magistrates, now they're going to start to accuse Paul and Silas of things that are not true. And we see this in, in verses 20 and 21. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews. Don't miss that. They are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept nor practice. You know, Paul 
told Timothy towards the end of his life as he wrote to him, he said that, you know, those who seek to live that way, that seek to get rich quickly, they oftentimes lead themselves to the opposite. They lead themselves to destruction. That's why he said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 9 and 10, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmless desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Notice he didn't say that money is evil, but the love of it is evil. And that was clearly why these men's lives were starting to fall apart but in response to what they had done, they're simply now trying to get their pound of flesh. They're trying to get revenge. So they start accusing Paul of things that aren't true. First, they use Paul and Silas's ethnic heritage against them. All of a sudden, an ugly head of anti-Semitism rises up, and they, first of all, say, these Jewish guys are screwing up our culture. That's the first thing they charge them with. And then they take it farther than that, and they say they're also teaching them crazy customs. In other words, they're bringing in their Jewish faith, and we don't need that in our culture. Now... I would like to suggest to you that in doing so, there was a shrewd little bit of, uh, uh, I guess you could say, maneuvering that these guys were doing because they had known what the emperor had proclaimed, and it would later be written about by Luke in the book of Acts when he would say in Acts 18.2 that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to be removed from Rome. Therefore, they knew that if they brought this Jewish issue up, that this potentially would cause the officials there in Philippi to turn on Paul and Silas. They also, Paul and Silas knew that this was something that had been predicted, that they would experience things like this. You might recall Jesus had actually told the disciples when he was alive in Mark 13, 19, be on guard for they will not only deliver you over to councils and to be beaten in the synagogue, I mean, that's what will happen with the Jews. But then he goes on and he says, you will stand before governors and kings for my sake. They knew that this was going to happen. They knew that they would be accused falsely and that they would have to give an account to government officials as a result. And as a result of these accusations, they stir the crowd up. They stir the mob up. And the mob starts to respond. And we see that as we continue along in verses 22 to 24, the crowd joined on now in attacking them. And the magistrates tore their garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. When they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this, this order, the jailer put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet. And stocks. I want you to see how these men, they inspired some incredibly ugly things. An injustice that all of a sudden arrives in three different ways right there in Philippi. As a result of Paul and Silas being on mission, doing a good thing, rescuing somebody who is bound, who is literally a slave, who's being trafficked, rescuing her from that bondage. These men... <laughs> Now, as they seek their revenge, they inspire the mob's violence. They emotionally whip them into a frenzy, and they cause the mob to want blood. Second, they inspire the local officials to an incredible form of misconduct. It actually says right there in verse 23, or excuse me, verse 22. Look at this, how it says it. It says the crowd not only joined in attacking them, but the magistrates, the officials, the officials are the ones that stripped them and gave orders to beat them. The officials join in in the misconduct. They shame Paul and Silas. They strip them of their dignity. They order them beaten because they want to try to satisfy the frenzied mob. And then the officials create an official cover-up to try to cover up their mess. Notice as it continues that he says to the jailer, as they beat them up, he says to the jailer, keep them safely. He knew he had no right to kill them. 
He had no right to order their death. So he's trying to keep them from the mob, but he's also trying to cover up what he just did. They couldn't allow the mob to kill them. So the official tells him to secure them safely. He knew that if, that if they had lost their life, that the emperor could potentially say, you can't control your city. So they imprisoned them where the mob couldn't reach. He also knew that if the prisoners escaped, that the emperor could potentially say that you can't control your prisoners. So they shackled them in. They put them in stocks inside the cell. I mean, it's not just one thing to shut the door, but we're going to put you in stocks so that you can't move inside the cell. We're going to completely secure you. Friends, this was an ugly situation. All because they simply tried to help a girl in need. Friends, it makes me realize that if we are going to be about living on mission, friends, we have to realize unbelievers will test the loyalty that we have to our calling, just like they tested Paul and Silas. They will test you, they will test me, and we should expect it. Peter tells us in his first epistle, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when this happens by those who do not share your faith. He says it in the following way in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised by the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. It's going to happen. It's not if, it's when. So don't be surprised by it as though something strange was happened to you. But instead, rejoice. Rejoice. Insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Remember, the reason why the world is reacting as they are reacting is because when they see you living the way that you're living, when they see you responding to these things the way that you respond to them, it reminds them of what is coming for them. You might say, well, what are you talking about? Well, listen to how Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, for we are an aroma of Christ to God amongst those who are being saved and amongst those who are perishing. He's saying that we remind, just like when you walk into the kitchen and you smell the aroma of that chocolate cake in the oven, you know exactly what it is. You smell the aroma and you know that is chocolate cake. My nose reminds me of it. Well, When you live your life, you remind people of who you are. You remind people that you belong to Christ, or you remind people that you don't belong to him. He's saying, as a result, people, when they look at you and I, we are an aroma of Christ. We are an aroma that reminds some of a fragrance that's from death to death. It reminds them that unless they repent and unless they choose to follow Christ, that that is what is coming for them. But we're also a fragrance of life to life that shows who we belong to, that we are on Christ's team. Friends, these people, they're responding as they are because they realize that they're in trouble. And here in a few moments, you're going to see how the officials respond to the trouble that they find themselves in. So don't be surprised when this happens. Instead, we need to find ways to help each other when it does. Finally, I want you to see something that finally happened. Unjust captivity. And it was truly that. This was an injustice. Unjust captivity, it opened unexpected doors. You might say, well, if it's unjust, why would God allow it to happen? Well, can I suggest that God's ways aren't your ways? If it was unjust, why in the world would God allow them to suffer as he did? Because God had a different plan. And he's going to show us what that is here in a moment. In verse 25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening. Don't, no, don't miss that. They're in a horrible situation. They're in a prison cell. They're not only in a prison cell, but they got stocks on their feet. They're locked in. They can't move. And what's their response? Prayer and praise. Can you imagine? Also imagine what all the other prisoners as they're hearing this are thinking. Seriously? That's your response to this? 
it was speaking loud and clear to every single one in that prison. It's why Paul would say later in a different prison when he was in Rome, he's actually writing a letter back to his friends in Philippi. And listen to what he says in a prison cell in Rome to them. He says in Philippians 1, 12 to 14, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are more bold now as a result to speak on the Lord's behalf without fear. God was using his imprisonment for his purposes. And in the very same letter, that's why Paul would say, don't miss this. In the very same letter, as he's writing back to Philippi in chapter 4, you've heard it before. Listen to what he says. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Yes, even in a jail cell. Rejoice. The outward circumstances do not have to control the inward reality. Rejoice. Hold on to him, no matter where you find yourself. That's what they're doing there in that prison cell, and the other prisoners are taking notice. And it's at this point in time that God begins to move, and their mission begins to restart. Because of their proper response to suffering, God literally begins to open doors, verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and every bond was unfastened. You know, growing up as a kid, we used to sometimes play with locks that were a little bit flimsy. And if you've ever played with a lock that can be moved around, it's interesting how you can move it and it will pop and it will come undone. That's exactly what this earthquake did, is it shook the foundations of that prison so much that the door swung wide open, that the stocks, they just popped open. As a result, literally, God was opening doors. Literally, he was opening doors in Paul and Silas's life. But what you're going to see is he wasn't just opening doors physically. He was opening doors spiritually. Look at verses 27 to 28. When the jailer woke up and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. He knew that if he lost his prisoners, according to Roman law, he was going to lose his life. So naturally thinking a humiliating, painful death, suicide seemed like a better option to him. So he's ready to take himself out. But Paul, verse 28, cries out with a loud voice, Don't harm yourself, for we are all still here. And the jailer called for the lights. And he rushed in, and trembling in fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. His expectation was a painful death. But instead, what he's going to find is that God has a joyful salvation for him. The jailer thought that they had all escaped. But... Interestingly, not one did. And they could have. The doors were open. The bonds were broken. They could have all run for their lives, but not one of them did. Now, the reason that they didn't run are not completely clear. That's not given to us. But what we can say without certainty, as we said just a moment ago, is that God had purpose for them all being there. Why? Because God had a purpose in that jailer's life. He wanted to transform his heart. We see what God does in his life as we continue along in verse 30. Then he brought Paul and Silas out and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They responded, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour that night. He washed their wounds He was baptized at once with his family. Then he brought them up to his house, set food before them. He rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. What an incredible transformation. Incredible transformation. This man that just a few moments ago was expecting a painful death has now received a glorious transformation 
What's the evidence of the transformation that had taken place in his life? Yes, his baptism, where he declares that I'm following Jesus. But even more, he allows his family. I mean, if you truly don't believe something, you're not going to pass it on. You're not going to import it to those that are most important in your life. You're not going to allow your family to hear it. And he allows his family to hear the good news, and their life has changed as well. It's also interesting that after Paul and Barnabas had been unjustly beaten, after this man's life is transformed, what's the very first thing he does? He takes them out and he says, here, let me wash your wounds. Let me put salve on them to help them heal. He treats the wounds that had been unjustly given, and he brings them into his house, and he shows them a form of hospitality that can only be seen from a brother or sister in Christ as he feeds them a meal. This man's life had been marvelously transformed as God began to open doors spiritually right there in the prison. But as we conclude the text together this morning, what you're going to see is, is that God also acts to open doors publicly so that the mission, so that the ministry can continue to reach out and spread from that point forward. There's man's life who had been transformed. Now, naturally, you would think he would be thinking like Paul and Silas, but there was still more for him to learn. And we see that as we continue along in verse 35. But when it was day, the officials, the ones who had created this official cover-up in the prison, they say to the police, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul and Silas. The magistrates have set you free. You are free to go. Therefore, now go in peace. You know, it's interesting. You would naturally think Paul and Silas, they would have received that news like, woohoo, let's go and let's not let the door hit us as we go. But that wasn't their response at all. Quite the opposite. Paul wanted much more. He wanted freedom now, freedom in the future. He wanted some assurances. Because he wanted to be able to continue to reach out with the good news of the gospel. He didn't want to simply be chased out of the city of Philippi with his tail between his legs like somebody had shot him out of a cannon and he was never going to be allowed to return. He wanted to be able to return to preach the good news. He wanted for his brothers and sisters in Philippi to be able to preach the good news and for their lives not to be threatened. So Paul responds... And he challenges them back, and he says, but Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, notice, uncondemned, unjustly. Men who are Roman citizens, and as soon as they heard that, the jailer and the officials, it's like, whoa, you're Roman citizens? They're taking note. You've thrown us into prison, and now you throw us out secretly? You tell us to go? No, 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 Paul says. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the officials, and they were afraid when they had heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came immediately, and they apologized. I'm sure they were apologizing. They were apologizing all over themselves at this point in time because they knew that their future was in jeopardy now. And they took them out, and they asked them to Please leave our city. Please leave us alone so that we don't get in trouble. So they went out of the prison and they visited Lydia, the one who had come to Christ. And when they had seen other brothers and sisters and encouraged them, it was then that they departed. Hearing that these men were Roman citizens, Paul, who had actually been a Roman citizen ever since he was born, we actually know this because in Acts chapter 22, when he was in Jerusalem, and another mob had risen up against him, the Romans rescue Paul. They bring him into the citadel, and there he has an interesting conversation with one of the officials in, in, in Jerusalem. The tribune comes to Paul, and he says to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Paul says, yes. The tribune answered, I bought my citizenship with money, with a large sum. Listen to what Paul said. I, I've been a citizen since birth. Paul was truly part of the Roman culture because he was born into it. You've heard the old saying, membership has its privileges. Paul was using it. He was using it right now. 
It was illegal to unjustly harm a Roman citizen without a finding of guilt. They beat him up. It was illegal to jail a Roman citizen to take their freedom without a finding of guilt. And that's exactly what they did. And the officials knew that they could be removed from their office of power there in Philippi. Even more, if the emperor really got angry, he could take Philippi's place of privilege as the seat of government in Macedonia and move it to another city. He knew that there was a great cost in this. So immediately the officials, they come running, and they are willing to make the public apology, to say, we are so sorry that we allowed this to happen, not to say anything of the men who had been trafficking that girl who started all this. We don't know where they are. They are off cowering in some corner as they realize that they have way overstepped. It's one thing to be given a pardon. Paul didn't want a pardon. He wanted everyone to know he was not guilty. Paul knew this. He wanted his reputation back. Why? Because he wanted to be able to preach the gospel. And he wanted that cloud to be removed from his head so that people would be able to hear and know that he was a minister of the one true God. He wanted doors to continue to remain open for his friends there in Philippi so that they could preach the gospel freely as well. Friends, can I suggest... Often the doors that God wants to swing open for us, they don't come easy. Those opportunities are not easily found. Those doors that we want to be able to walk through, they often come through injustice. They often come through times of suffering. That's why it's often been said that the church grows, grows most during times of suffering. I'm sure that if you had talked to Paul, if you had talked to Silas, if you had talked to some of the other apostles, if they had an opportunity, they would probably say, you know what, if growth comes through suffering, if growth comes through injustice, if lives are changed as we have to go through difficulty, bring it on. Because they knew that God would be glorified and lives would be changed. That's why Peter would challenge each one of us this morning with the following statement in 1 Peter 3, 14 to 16. If you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Now, friends, that does not mean that we should look to be a martyr. That does not mean that we should run around looking for difficulty. But if it does come, you're blessed. It's an opportunity to glorify Christ. So have no fear. Don't be troubled, but in your heart instead, honor Christ as the Lord of your life. Always as a result, be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that you have. Do it with gentleness. Do it with respect. And in so doing, you'll have a good conscience so that when you are slandered, just as Paul and Silas was slandered there in Philippi, those who revile you, those who speak badly about your good behavior in Christ, Ultimately, they will be put to shame. Ultimately, they're going to be running to you and saying, we apologize, we screwed up. But you have to respond to it properly. You can't go about, just like I teach my daughters all the time, seeking to return evil for evil. Instead, we are called to give good for evil. Paul and Silas knew that. God used it. And lives were transformed and changed there in Philippi. Friends, can I conclude by asking this simple question then? What should our response be? What response should we have to the potential perils that could face us in the big city? I mean, Bucharest is very similar to Philippi. It's a seat of government. It's a seat of a lot of the main key things that happen here in this culture. Just like Paul and Silas, as a result, we could face being slandered. We could have people talk badly about us. We could go through injustice, maybe even be harmed for what we believe, maybe lose our freedom. How should we then respond? Well, I want you to go back and remember what Paul and Silas did when they first got to Philippi. When they, when they first got there, they were where they were supposed to be. On the Sabbath day, they're, trying, they're seeking a place to worship. So can I encourage you, 
How do we respond to the potential harms here in this city? Stay connected. Yes, stay connected to the vine. Because apart from him, you can do nothing. But stay connected to each other. Stay connected to the body. Because in the body, there is not only provision, there is protection. The reason we gather is, yes, to learn, but also so that we in fellowship can help each other. So stay connected. Secondly, can I also encourage you? Expect difficulty. It's not if it's going to happen. It's when it's going to happen. And when it does, how will you respond? Are you going to simply seek to get your pound of flesh just like those men who were trafficking that girl? Or will you instead seek to return good for evil? Expect it. It will come. The question is, how will you respond? And finally, embrace the test. Embrace it when it comes. Rejoice in suffering. Why? Because just like Peter said, it will lead to your good. It will lead to my good. Remember those words that he wrote, all things work together for good for those who are called and are called, are, 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 for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Do you believe it? If you do believe it, trust that even in the test, God is doing something good. Friends, I've been told by friends of mine in the military, and my dear brother over here, he can probably attest to what I'm about ready to say. I've been told that these principles are true for men who go out on mission. You got to stay connected to your brother because you got to have somebody who will cover your six, right? <laughs> we call that who's got your back. But it's not just about who's got your back. When you're out on mission, I've been told that they are taught to expect the enemy because you don't know where the enemy is going to come from. And when the enemy shows up and you expect that they will show up, they're going to show up with bad intentions. So you got to have somebody to cover your back and you've got to have somebody that's going to be with you because the enemy is coming. But finally, I've been told that for those who have served that they're also taught when they go out on mission to embrace the mission. Now, that sounds funny. Really? Embrace the mission? Yeah, embrace the mission. Why? Because the sooner the mission is over, you get to go where? Home. So embrace the mission so that you can get through it quickly and get back home. Friends, the reason why in the church we need each other, do you not realize you're at war as well? You might not see the enemy, but I guarantee you the enemy sees you. Therefore, you need your brother. You need your sister. We need each other because of the war that we find ourselves in. So who's got your back this morning? Friends, as we move forward here at the church, Paul had Silas. Barnabas had... John Mark, who's got your back? Who's your brother? Who's your sister? Who are you making this journey with? Because I promise you, you need somebody as you make the journey. I hope you'll find that person. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to help us not to forget this simple lesson. Lord, I praise you for how you used Paul and Silas there in Philippi, for how Lydia's life was changed, and for how it sets an example for us as, as they responded to difficult times. We can respond the same way. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to do what they did, that we would stay connected to each other, that we would expect the difficulties, but when the difficulties come, that we would embrace it because we know it's going to lead to good. So God, help us to stay together, to stay united as one body in Christ, so that we can see you glorified in each of our lives and through your church. Help us, Lord, to go, and as we go, to seek to do mission together. Go with us now, I pray, and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Amen.